from gorillas in the Democratic Republic of Congo to herons in Chesapeake Bay and falcons in downtown Baltimore. From the polar bears and beluga whales of Hudson Bay to manatee-filled freshwater springs in Florida. From bald eagle and condor nests perched above the Pacific to an Alaskan river filled with brown bears and salmon. As the world's largest live nature cam network, Explore.org hosts cameras that stream footage from many areas across the planet. Installing and maintaining the cams and getting their feeds online is challenging, especially when the cameras broadcast from remote locations, such as Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska. Hello, everyone. This is Mike Fitz, your resident naturalist with Explore.org. Today, we're talking about the tech of the bear cams and attempting to answer the question, how do they work? My guess are Candace Rush, Explore.org's Director of New Media, and Joe Pfeiffer, the uh, Field Operations Manager for Explore.org. They're part of the small yet dedicated team working behind the scenes to make the bear cam and the other webcams on Explore.org a reality for you. And I'm looking forward to learning uh, from their expertise on how these cameras work. So uh, Candace and Joe, thanks so much for joining me this afternoon. Hey. Hey Mike, nice how are you? you? I'm doing well, it's great to speak with you again. And uh, I have a ton of questions for you. Many of them are just questions that I'm curious about. Uh, I know a lot of these questions uh, the audience is curious about, and we've been kind of uh, corralling a lot of these questions over the summer since the bear cams went live. And we're gonna try to answer as many of those as possible. Before I jump into those, however, I wanna make sure that um, everyone's aware of the bear cam viewer survey. Uh, that you can find a link for in the feature comment uh, below the live camera feed. Just scroll down towards the bottom of the page. If you can take that, I would, I would appreciate it. I'm very curious to know more about your bear cam viewing experience and how it impacts uh, your views on wildlife conservation. And I'm working with several researchers that are looking at, uh, that, uh, at your views on the webcams. Uh, so please fill that out if you have the opportunity. To begin, however, I, I really want to provide the audience with some context of where Brooks River is and, and uh, in its relation to the rest of the world. And we're going to pull up here a video, a quick video, because along with um, our webcam partner, uh, the National Park Service, Explore.org hosts and, and maintains several webcams along Brooks River. Brooks River is located about 300 miles southwest of Anchorage, Alaska, in Katmai National Park. The river is about a mile and a half long. And the falls is about halfway along the river's length. We uh, host several webcams along the river. The signal from those bear cams is sent from the river up to not one, but two radio repeaters on Dumpling Mountain. And those repeaters relay the signal to the small town of King Salmon, about 30 miles away, where, the, where it's sent to the rest of the world. So it's a remote location off the grid and it, and you know, getting the signal out from these locations does pose a challenge. And this overlay here represents where our cameras are at, uh, at, at Brooks River. So several near the falls and then several at the river mouth itself. In total, you get to see virtually all of the lower half of Brooks River. There's a small smidgen of space uh, downstream of the area that we like to call the cut bank that you can't see from the falls or you can't see from the river watch camera but that's really maybe only one to 200 yards of space that we can't see so it's a very narrow spot on the river that we can't see we can see virtually all of the river itself i want to try to dive um you know with uh, candace and joe i want to try to dive to the river with you right now and talk about some of the some of the uh, logistics of getting that signal out and also the, the hardware that it takes to get the signal out of the Brooks River area. And Joe, first of all, can you tell us a little bit about the cameras that you use um, to uh, at the river? What types of cameras are used for these live cams? Sure. So basically we use just high-end uh, um, and they have pan tilt zoom capabilities. Uh, we use these uh, mostly for their high definition capabilities as well as their low power consumption. Um, <clears throat> these have been, you know, they're, they're outdoor rated, so they, they work well in this type of environment. And, um, you know, this is basically what we use on most of our um, partner sites. And, and Candace, uh, what 
internet speed is required to upload you know the footage to the to the rest of the world it's just it's probably not something that everyone has available to them at home um actually you'd be surprised so uh per camera we need between like two and four megabits a second brian are you getting an echo or is that just me hearing myself echo sorry um so yeah in between two and four megabits a second per camera uh we have i think six or seven cameras at works fall so do the math we need a lot of bandwidth somewhere between um like 18 to 20 megs which is what we finally have um we finally managed to upgrade our bandwidth this year which is really really good but to make sure that we um are staying under that you don't experience buffering drop dropped frames all the rest of it um we have to monitor that that data really closely so joe does it i do it brian does it he's the one doing all the switching currently um and we also have to limit the number of camera operators that are controlling the cam at a time sometimes we'll have to take it reduce the bandwidth on a specific camera um so we are pretty hands-on making sure that we stay underneath our 20 minute cap uh so that you guys get the best quality possible and you were able to upgrade the bandwidth this year is that that correct yeah we had 17 last year we have 20 this year so we were able to up the resolution on some cameras. We're able to allow camera operators to control more cameras. And for Naomi specifically, she's really happy. A lot of people remember that whenever we had to do a live chat at Burke's Falls, we had to turn off one of the cameras, generally the underwater camera, to free up bandwidth. We don't have to do that this year. And Naomi can like upload a photo to Facebook without having to like shut down all the cameras. It used to be that whatever media ranger was at the park had to wait until after 10 p.m. when the peak action had gone for them to get online and do anything on the cameras because it would the moment they signed on, our cameras would die. So we we've got a little bit more headroom, better quality of life for Naomi. We don't have to turn on stuff for live chats anymore. So all around, it's been better. And I do remember when I was a ranger at Brooks River getting asked quite a bit what I'm doing on the internet. <laughs> because yeah, people would be like, yeah. the cams are down. What's happening? Are you doing anything? No, it's not me. So sometimes it was, a lot of times it wasn't. But yeah, if I wanted yeah. to upload things, it definitely was a late night to try to do that. So I know that the Rangers yeah. up there are appreciative of those of those changes. Uh, getting back to some of the um, technical aspects of uh, the hardware at the river, Joe, uh, can you can you talk a little bit more about how the cameras, cameras are powered? Uh, I mentioned before, or I think I tr wanted to mention at least, that Brooks River is off-grid, so there's no uh, power lines or roads that run to Brooks River. So how, are, how is the system being powered? Well, um, you know, starting at Dumpling, so those are 100% off-grid um, power systems. So basically, they're powered by batteries, and then we are relying on the sun energy to recharge those batteries. Um, at the repeater sites, we have small generators that will kick on when there's like uh, two or three days of overcast. Um, and in years past, we did have those wind generators there and that just, that helped kind of give it another alternative source of uh, a charge for the batteries. This year, we weren't able to put new ones in just due to you know, constraints and time and um, just getting the generators up there. So this year we are 100% reliant on the sun and then we've got the backup generators. Um, down at the falls, that is a, a bit larger solar array. So I think there's six solar panels total and, um, and that's it. So it's just sun down at the falls the fall seems to get a lot better sun than up at Dumpling Mountain most of the time. Um, and then the lower river, so that is all ran off the generator, the diesel generator that's on the Brooks side of, or on the lodge side of Brooks Camp. So that's basically grid power dependent upon uh, the NPS staff who maintain that generator and everything. As long as that thing's running, uh, lower river will have power. Um, you know, the biggest challenge in all of it is definitely the top of the mountain, just with the drastic uh, conditions and temperature, especially when you know, once we start getting into the fall months, the colder temperatures, uh, that's when the challenges really start. Right now, we're kind of coasting 
with all the sun in Alaska right now, uh, usually June and July and most of August are pretty problem free. I'm not going wood. Um, and then September and October are usually the more challenging months. Yeah, there's a lot of sunlight in, in Alaska in general right now. And Brooks River is still experiencing something like, you know, 19, 20 hours of daylight overall. But come, you know, the fall solstice or excuse me, the fall equinox, um, it's it's going to be dwindling very, very quickly. So we always have to keep our fingers crossed that the power system up on Dumpling Mountain stays, you know, uh, stays operational. When, when there isn't any... Uh, sunlight available to like the fall system joe how long could the um could the falls cam operate before like that the battery system there drains do you have an estimate on that sure um what we do is you know i monitor the power very closely so it is it's a balancing act an estimation would be like seven days total um for the falls high camera to stay online and that's as long as we're, we're turning off, say, the low cam and the riffles just to put all the power to the falls cam and to the wireless link. Um, but I think seven days is a pretty good estimate based on the battery bank there. Um, and it would have to be, you know, quite a weather to, to not get any charge for seven days would be very unique right now, especially. And what about uh, weatherproofing the, the system? Uh, Dumpling Mountain is a pretty, you know, it's the difference between uh, the river and the elevation at the river in Dumpling Mountain is fewer than 2,500 feet, but the, the weather up on Dumpling is very, very different. Uh, so how are you uh, making uh, or and trying to ensure that the system lasts uh, the, the, the harsh weather that is experienced up on top of the mountain? Sure. So we're, you know, everything that we use is uh, outdoor rated. So um, basically, like these, those black boxes, they're Pelican cases, they're, they're weatherproof, they can survive in, in a hurricane. Um, you know, really the any any penetrations that are coming into that box, the cables and everything is housed inside of some sort of uh, plastic or PVC conduit um, and then some sort of a weatherproof connector to kind of cap it off or silicone of some sort. Um, you know, the most important part of, of these boxes in particular is closing the lid, you know, once the work is done and making sure that it's shut. Uh, usually if there is any sort of water intrusion, it's due to some sort of just nor like the lid wasn't closed uh, tightly or something like that. But as long as those things are closed, then then they should be waterproof. Um, and then these boxes sit on top of just a, an aluminum frame that is uh, sitting on top of the mountain. And that aluminum so far has held up for, I think, four or five years now at this point. Yeah, that, that aluminum frame right there. And uh, the guy wires there that you see that just kind of holds it to once the the winds start kicking up there, um, there's always the chance that that thing could just simply blow off the mountain. So those guy wires help it um, stay in place. So far, so good. Yeah, that Not was one of our big fears this yeah. year. That, that tower had blown over. We just didn't know. We had, a ranger, had to have a ranger walk up and like look at it just to let us know it was still around. And that has happened before, uh, the uh, not with the, the Explore system, but with the National Park Service radio repeater that's up there that basically allows the rangers at Brooks River to talk to the headquarters in King Salmon. That has blown over completely before. So, yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, when you when you look at the, those really windy days uh, at the mouth of Brooks River and there's big three foot waves coming off of the lake, uh, you know, it can be blowing 70, 80 miles an hour or more up on the top of Dumpling Mountain. So those things really do have to be secure. And, and weatherproofed well. One of the one of the cameras that's maybe most difficult to weatherproof though is uh, the underwater camera. And this year you weren't actually able to get down into the water and, and really take a good, a good look at it. And sometimes people have been seeing like some pink flashing uh, on the underwater camera. Is that because it's been under the water for more than a year? Yeah, um, basically I can only give you my best guess, but um, I would say 
there's some sort of water intrusion into the enclosure and there's just a little tiny camera sensor in there. Uh, usually the pink flashing is kind of a, an indication that something is happening and it could be, you know, slowly dying. The fact that it survived all winter in the water and it still looks relatively really good considering um, where it's been for so long. Uh, I was definitely impressed with the fact that it even came back to life and everything. So yeah, we had I think it'll last um, all year. I think you might start seeing more and more of the pink flashing, uh, but ultimately, you know, we'll swap that camera out with a, with another underwater rated camera. Yeah, we had fully expected that camera not to come back. And then when it turned on, we were all surprised. Yeah. And I enjoy watching that camera very much. It, it offers just a unique perspective on the river. Great looks at the fish, rainbow trout, salmon, and um, and other fish species as well. And of course, the occasional bear swimming by. So it's it's wonderful to see that perspective on the river. I'm, I'm glad that camera survived this year. Of course, like we said, um, you know, the Brooks, Brooks Camp is basically off the grid. So any power that's produced there is produced on site. There aren't any power lines that go up to Dumpling Mountain, no power lines or uh, fiber optic cable that run to King Salmon. So uh, how are we getting the, the, the signal from Brooks River to Dumpling Mountain and then to King Salmon? Can you explain a little bit of that wireless dynamic? Sure. Um, so we have our, our internet is landed in, in King Salmon. And then we have a, about a 30, 30 mile link to the top of the mountain. So that link is essentially our, our backhaul link that as long as that links up, I, uh, we have internet on top of the mountain. Um, from the mountain, then that's where we, we use a, an antenna that's called a sector antenna and it basically lights up all of um, Brooks River, the whole entire camp um, with the ability to connect something from Brooks up to the mountain. Uh, so it's all, all wireless uh, point to point uh, links and you know, the, the most challenging one of those is the 30 mile link. Uh, we did upgrade that this year. Uh, we actually also moved um, some equipment in King Salmon um, for the upgraded internet as well. So we actually did a lot, uh, mostly in King Salmon that has, the result of what we did in King Salmon has improved the overall stability of the entire system. Um, you know, what viewers ultimately will see are, are less highlights and just kind of less overall glitchiness happening on the cameras. Um, but there's the technician uh, swapping out a radio. That's the big radio that shoots up to Dumpling Mountain. And um, that is on a, the NPS uh, radio tower that's right there in King Salmon. And um, so far, so good. And this year especially has been a challenging year, really for all of us and in so many different ways. So, so maybe we can talk about, um, you know, what you would do, um, both of you would do in a normal year. How would you go for planning for the camera installation at Brooks River in a normal year? And then what additional challenges did you face in this year due to the pandemic? Sure, uh, well, in a normal year, you know, basically, the first where I start is what broke last year or what, what, how did the system go down last year? This year, for example, the system went down right around the end of October, just all of a sudden, and there was no way of telling why. There was just no way to get up to the mountain. At that point, uh, snow started falling and it was just, you're going to have to wait until next year to even see what happened. Um, so going kind of blind into a situation like that, you know, I, I approach it expecting the worst, assuming the worst that, you know, the, everything kind of the, the system on top of the mountain blew off the mountain. So then I just start conquering those little items. Um, you know, I asked the park service, they did a flyby in a plane, took a picture. So I was like, okay, it's there that, you know, there's some, somewhere to start. Um, Ultimately, you know, just kind of 
running through the different scenarios of what could have possibly have gone wrong and then addressing them during my planning phase as far as what hardware that I need to get up to Alaska. Um, how is it going to be configured? How am I going to get the hardware from King Salmon up to the mountain? Um, helicopter flights, you know, all the logistics involved. And what kind of support do I need from the Park Service uh, maintenance crew with their boats and planes and helicopters and whatnot? Um, but all of that goes into planning. Um, you know, this year, we not only did we get the system up, but we also discovered why it went down last year. And it was just a failed hardware component on Dumpling Mountain. So it was really not that huge of an issue, but. Um, it was kind of impossible to just assume that one piece is what failed because it could have been one of dozens of items that could possibly have failed. Um, so that was how I began planning uh, this year. You know, we, we probably start planning this in January is when we start having phone calls and ramping things up. You know, during that time, um, my plans involved me going up there with a team in, I'd say March that shifted drastically, um, kind of coming to the realization that I wasn't, I'm not going to be able to go up to Alaska. Um, so, you know, with this year in particular, that was the biggest challenge of not having an explorer team up there to do this. So I have to find local resources to do it. Um, with the help of our internet service provider, um, GCI in King Salmon, they provided the local talent and, uh, I was able to, you know, give them very detailed instruction on exactly what to do. I built a lot of hardware here, pre-configured, basically plug and play just to make it as simple as possible for them and to just allow for as much time as possible to address any issues when it came to the actual field work. So all of that worked basically. Um, so that was the biggest challenge this year was doing it all remotely communication prior to getting the internet up on top of the mountain. That's a huge challenge with satellite phones that sometimes work, sometimes don't. Um, and then, you know, giving these guys kind of real quick shotgun lessons on exactly what should happen. But if it doesn't, you know, try these things. And then they, they go, they're hiking up the mountain or they're on a boat to the camp, hike up the mountain. Hopefully they remember everything, but ultimately they got it done. So, you know, I was very impressed. Yeah. Um, Joe makes that sound super simple, but like there was probably, I don't know, at least six full weeks where Joe did nothing but build and configure and talk to National Park and GCI about like what resources we actually had. Um, and there'd be days when Joe'd be like, okay, I'm virtually on top of the mountain right now. What am I supposed to be building? And having to do that like remotely, to fully remotely build anything and then just hope you did it right by the time they get up there that they can plug it in, it'll, it'll work. It was very, very impressive to see that done this year. Um, it's al almost all, like a, oh, mm -hmm. please go ahead. Oh, no, 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 um, no, it's fine. I was, um, yeah, thinking about it and how it's it's almost like a mini version of what NASA does in a sense. You know, they got to build the yeah. rover to send to mm -hmm. Mars and they got to test it out. And then, you know, keep your fingers crossed that everything sort of works when it yeah. gets there. So it is a very impressive feat for everyone who was involved in that. So, um, and I was, yeah, I was, I was, I was, I, I have to admit, I was a little bit worried this year. And we we all needed bear cam, I think, this year more than ever. So I think everyone is very, very appreciative of, of your efforts uh, so far. Yeah, big shout out to GCI for having people who were capable of doing this in Alaska already. So they didn't have to do the quarantine. And um, they were really on top of it, which was great. I mean, outside of all that, the, the last steps to get cameras online really just involves coordinating with Catherine's cam op team and coordinating with the social team. And we'll start, much like planning for the tech side of it, we'll start planning that in January. We'll also have to connect with National Park and the Conservancy in like January, February to start planning for like promotion, 
um, any known park policy changes we need to address, anything like that, we also have to start planning for that side of it in January, February as well. So we're basically talking to Katmai about either turning up or turning down the system all year. And it, working with, um, you know, the federal government, especially the National Park Service, it's a little bit different than working with a, like a private partner who may put, be, be able to put a camera up in a in a private like nature sanctuary or something like that. They may have their own specific rules, um, but, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, considerations with doing this sort of work in national parks. So mm -hmm. there's that extra layer to make sure that all of our T or all of our T's are crossed and I's are dotted. Yep. So it's, it's a lot of work behind the scenes to get this ready. I, most of the time, I'm just kind of sort of sitting back in the spring, sort of like twiddling my thumbs waiting. <laughs> and now it's yeah. the really busy season for me. It's also still very busy for Candace and Joe. So it doesn't really yeah. slow down for them ever. But I get a little bit, little bit of a break when, they, when the cameras aren't online. But they're working extremely hard year round. Yeah. Uh, we... Uh, you know, we, Candace, we talked, um, you mentioned just now, you know, a little bit of those extra considerations that you need to think about before you push the cameras uh, live mm -hmm. for the public. Uh, you know, right this year, um, there's some other things that are going on behind the scenes. You're trying to manage like the quality of the views um, and and just the, the overall ability of the, the cameras themselves to take in the scene. Sometimes the camera view, like at the falls, can look a little pixelated and we've received a lot of questions this year about image quality so can you talk about what might affect um image quality with uh with the bear cams on the river a lot of things so um i would like a few so i'd like to first talk about the difference between resolution and image quality some people use those two things as basically the same thing right but a resolution is really just a measure of how many pixels are in your image 1920 by 1080 or like 4,000, right? So you can have an image with that many pixels that has, doesn't have great image quality. Image quality is a measure of a lot of things, right? So it is your resolution, um, but it's also your bandwidth. It's about how much light the camera's getting. It's about how sensitive the image sensor is. It's about how old the camera is, how well is it starting to fail to cope with low light scenarios. Um, so all of those things come together. And then on top of that, um, YouTube, due to COVID and just the increased use of internet all around the world, has started to default when you open the page, it'll default it to 720 or lower. Um, so that you need to go on that like bottom control bar, you need to click, oh goodness, there's too much, too much noise on my sorry. You'll need to click um, that little settings wheel and then move it back to HD, right? Because a lot of people don't realize that like when you first open it, YouTube's gonna automatically default lower and Netflix has done the same thing just because of the amount of internet that's being taken up around the world. Um, ISPs just haven't been able to cope. So one, make sure your YouTube setting is set to HD, but also um, you'll notice in the morning when there's that high contrast, there's lots of pixelation. Um, if it's really dark, you'll see pixelation. Uh, if we've had to reduce the bandwidth for some reason, um, maybe something's not obeying the rules we set, or Naomi has to go upload a lot of photos or whatever it is, you'll start to see a little bit more pixelation. Um, and then at some level, right, this falls camera is old. Like, it's, I don't think it's been touched since 2016. It was out in the winter, just all winter, wasn't winterized this year, none of those cameras were winterized this year. Um, so it's it's starting to not perform as well as it used to, and then there are other better cameras on our system, so you can see the, the difference, right? Um, and yeah, one of the other disappointments of COVID this year was like we had upgrades planned for different cameras, including Brooks Falls, and we just couldn't do it. Um, the camera we want is still in China, so what are you going to do? Like it just didn't get delivered. So um, yeah, there's a lot there's a lot that goes into what the image quality is. Um, resolution is just one of the factors. One of the other considerations, of course, is trying to bring audio out of the system. Um, mm -hmm. We you know we have a microphone at the falls, we have a microphone at the riffles. We don't have a well, I don't actually know if there's a microphone now at the lower river. There used to be. I'm not sure if we put one in there last year, but if there is, there's no sound down there. Uh, yeah. So what uh, what were you thinking, or what are we thinking about when we're considering adding like a microphone to many of these cameras, especially those at the lower river? Yeah, this isn't uh, lower river specific. There's a number of cameras on our system that could support audio, but don't. There are actually mics there, but those are turned off at the request of the National Park Service. 
for privacy reasons. People stand on that bridge, and if they don't know that there's audio being recorded there, right, it's just we can't, like, ethically be broadcasting people's conversations to the world. Um, so they they asked us to turn it off. When there was limited limited viewership at the park, I asked them, like, hey, can we turn it on until the park opens? And she's like, let's just not bother. It's going to have to come off again, like, and it needs to be off. Um, this is also true for, like, why Maya? We get questions all the time. Why isn't there audio on Waimea? It's because that's on a lifeguard tower. You can hear lifeguard conversations. You can hear people on the beach having conversations. So a lot of our cameras, um, there's just no audio because they're in public places and we should, we don't want to be broadcasting private conversations. Um, and also like, even, and even if we like legally could, you know, do you want people walking by and like cussing up a storm? Like this is family friendly, right? We try to only have audio when we know we can control what that audio is going to be. And the mouth of Brooks River isn't necessarily a quiet place, I should say, either. When when people are visiting, yeah, besides the conversations that you might hear, a lot of airplanes. Um, not mm -hmm. so much yeah. this year, just due to the, the fact that there aren't a lot of people mm -hmm. visiting Brooks River. Uh, but last year, yeah, it's just like a constant, uh, it's like an airport, basically a mini airport yeah. there. So. You know, it's it can be very quiet and, and very peaceful at times, but during the middle of the day, especially, it is a very um, very noisy place overall. So yeah, a lot of considerations to keep in mind when we're when we're thinking about audio and, and where to put video. Who operates the cameras though, Candice? Uh, you know, we see the cameras moving around a lot. Um, occasionally, you know, people might wonder if there's some sort of AI involved that allows us to follow the cameras, but it's still all human powered right now. So who is who's operating uh, the cameras? Yeah, so there's uh, two potentially future three ways that we control cameras. Um, first and foremost, um, we have our volunteer camera operators who are led by Catherine, their fearless leader. She's great. And then all the camera operators are fantastic. They do a lot of training, especially on bear cam. Our bear cam cam ops are like really like are the most experienced ops that we have. Um, and so they're going around and like manually following the bears and showing you what's up. Um, some cameras we have on an auto tour. So we'll have it like if a camera operator doesn't move it in 10 minutes or something, it'll just start to pan around on its own. That's like um, Mount Diablo, right? We don't have camera operator on that camera. It just moves around. Um, and then there is one camera on our system that is operated by AI. And that's one of the Churchill cameras. And they have a radar that will like sense polar bears out and then it'll automatically zoom on them, which is like the most cutting edge and might be a way to get more curated experiences on those cameras that we just can't have an operator on all the time. But for the bear cams, we've got a person monitoring them almost all the time to help give us the best experience. And I know you don't necessarily want to talk too much about, you know, what the, the their interface looks like, but can you give us a little bit of an idea of what the camera operators use to control the cameras? Like when they're looking at a, a, at a screen, what do they see? Um, so we developed our own camera control system. Every single camera that we use, we use different models. You can log into the device and they've all got their own different UI, but logging into the device also takes up bandwidth and we always are trying to reduce the bandwidth load on the network. So we've got a separate camera control system that we can control the amount of data it's using and it's the same look across all of our cameras. So the controls will be uniform. They don't have to like go around and learn four different user interfaces for each different camera model. Um, and essentially it's just a lower resolution of what the camera is actually seeing um, with a little pan tilt zoom that you can't see me there, can you? right? A little, little box, little joystick box and the little zoom thing. So basically they can pan tilt um, and they can zoom and they can just monitor what's happening pretty much immediately right there. Um, we've also got several presets loaded in. So those are like automatic, if you press a button, it's gonna automatically go to this location. Um, and the admin cam ops have spent a lot of time mapping those presets because there's some cameras can have like 20 different presets and they have to manually add each different one preset, which is a lot for them. So good job guys for 170 some odd cameras. Um, yeah, so that, that's basically it. It's a, it's a uniform UI that shows you the camera and has a virtual joystick and a virtual zoom bar, and then they can control it. It's become more intuitive over the last year and a half. We've done a lot of work on it. Yeah. And if anyone's interested in becoming a volunteer camera operator for explore.org, you can um, inquire by writing to volunteer 
at explore.org. So, um, and uh, let us know what cameras you're interested in. There's a few follow-up questions that will be asked, like how much time you can commit, and um, some questions about internet speed, things of that nature. But yeah, please, um, you know, write to that email address, volunteer at explore.org, if you are interested. We're always recruiting new camera uh, operators. One camera that's really popular, you know, uh, Joe and Candice, uh, is the dumpling cam. Um, and that was, that's one that we have, uh, you know, available most summers uh, at streaming live from Katmai National Park, looking across the broad wilderness of the park itself. Uh, but we don't have that available this year. So why, why not? Why not dumpling? That's a question that's been asked a lot this year. Where's dumpling? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, Joe, you want to take this one? Sure. Um, well, it's there still, and it does work. Um, but the main reason is because uh, we weren't able to install the wind generators. I I just basically prioritize the lower river or and um, falls cameras, and conserve all the power just simply to relay the internet down to Brooks uh, Camp. That camera just simply adds a load to the dumpling temp repeater. Um, this year, the batteries that are in there are the same ones that were used uh, the last two years. At the dumpling repeater site, they are brand new batteries. So for me, I just, I am, um, I don't wanna take the risk of losing internet to all the cameras over that one single camera. In reality, it would probably be okay to turn on every now and then, but um, it's just a lot less riskier to just keep it off for this year and next year or whenever we can get up there again and swap those batteries out with brand new ones, then it would be just fine and also put a wind generator in. So basically it's about uh, power management is the main reason and um, you know, just ensuring that the falls has the best possible setup to keep that camera online for as long as possible. Yeah, and the first a benefit of having dumpling off is that we can have a higher resolution on some of the other cameras, like the lower river cameras. So if we turned that on, we'd have to readjust bandwidth. So it's a power consideration, and then we get better internet on the other cameras. Something that uh, often interferes with, um, you know, the clarity of the views. It's just that sometimes that the camera housing gets dirty, and a lot of times people are wondering, why don't you clean the cameras more often? So uh, that's something that, you know, we, we don't really have any control over. We have to be physically at the river to do it most often. But some of the cameras, uh, you know, th so you might have just have to wipe it off. Like we might just have to get rangers to clean the underwater camera, for instance. But some of the, some of the cameras still have an ability for self cleaning. Is that is that right? I don't know if we, Joe, I don't think we have the self cleaning enclosure on the lower river anymore, do we? I could be wrong. Not on lower river, no. no. Um, okay. Riffles and falls high. Yeah. Yeah. And the other, Mike, you can also speak to this that some locations, falls low in particular, you see that's kind of dirty right now. And also the underwater cam, um, that involves a ranger and like the falls low cam to clean that, like, it has to be clear of bears and you need the person cleaning it and you need somebody to watch around for bears. Like it's a whole bear thing just to even get the cameras cleaned in some of those locations. Yeah. For the underwater camera, it, it, you have to get into the water to do it. Uh, and the water can be quite deep near the camera itself. Uh, when I walked into there last, and I took this picture last July around this time to get in there, I was up to um, in my shoulders in water. The weather was, was quite warm, so it wasn't unpleasant. But when the weather's cold, uh, you know, you want to consider putting on a wetsuit or a dry suit to do it. You have to look for bears in the vicinity and and make sure that none are approaching the vicinity. So you need lookouts for you. So there's a whole bunch of considerations into cleaning that camera. And then a lot of them are just kind of hard to get to. Um, and it's um, not really legal to get to the uh, Falls Low Cam right now because that area below the platform where that camera is attached. Uh, is off limits to people between June 15 and August 15. So even yeah. if there weren't any bears around, that's kind of like a people-free zone at the moment mm -hmm. in the immediate vicinity of the falls. And then, and, uh, like, you know, uh, the go ahead. also just get scratched, right? The domes have been out all winter in an Alaskan winter, and they're out year after year after year, and they just get scratched, and 
there's like a, a film on the dome that starts to like peel and degrade, which is some of what you're seeing on the false high camera, which is like when the light's right at it, you can definitely see the age of the dome there. Um, again, things we wanted to upgrade or replace this year that we just couldn't, just couldn't do it because of COVID. And in general, how long can we expect the cams to stay live this year? Like, uh, for example, in the lower river cameras, I think you may have touched on this earlier, Joe, but how long, you know, can we expect those to stay on? And then, um, you know, if we, if we manage our power really well, what about some of those others that are off the grid? How long could we potentially keep those up if nothing else breaks? Well, for uh, lower river, that's pretty simple. It's just as long as that generator is running on the lodge side of the camp. Um, for falls, that's gonna that will run as long as there is um, sunlight that's recharging the batteries, um, and that goes for dumpling as well. If I think last year, if the um, one failure that happened at the end of October did would not have happened, I think we would have seen it go well into November, if not further. So my expectation this year is into November for the falls, you know, as long as all the systems stay the way they are right now and it's just a matter of powering, um, I could see that uh, being very possible. You know, it's weather dependent, so it also just depends on how is the weather out there. Um, but this year, I, that's kind of what my expectation is, is to see it run into November. Yeah. Well, let's hope let's hope that's the case. Let's hope for um, some breaks in the in the clouds this October and November for sure. And one final question for you uh, both. I I'd I'd like you to do a little bit of dreaming for a moment. If you could add anything to the bear cams to improve the experience, what would you add, and why would you add it? Oh, easy. I want that 4K cam for Brooks Falls. Uh, so much. We were so close, guys. <laughs> um, yeah, that would be, yeah, it's the same camera that they use on um, the Great Spirit Bluff cliff cam, and we'd be streaming it the same way that Raptor Resource streams there. So you get that, like, you get that 4K camera compressed down to 1080, so you get that, like, really nice, rich pixel depth off the zoom. It would be so beautiful next year. Fingers crossed. Hope we can. That's the dream. I'd say a, um, a a power run from King Salmon up to Dumpling Mountain. That would be very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Or uh, more underwater cameras would be my vote for sure. Um, I th we have several spots now on that on the pilings on the bridge, and I think it would be pretty cool to have several options for the underwater, um, just to see where the fish are. You can just go to where the fish are. Could be like we could like like drop something down from the center of that bridge and do a 360 underwater camera. That would be cool. So they could just like pan around on their own. Yeah, that'd be really nifty. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of things to dream about, you know, slowly but surely. Um, I think we'll, we'll get to those, uh, some of those things um, eventually to improve the, the bear cam viewing experience. And I know the other, the, the webcam team at explore.org, you know, we haven't talked about um, much, uh, you know, mentioned them much today, um, but the, there's a bunch of people working behind the website uh, to make that a, a, a great experience. Candace, do you want to mention uh, some of the staff that you work with? Yeah, okay. So first we got Brian, who's been doing all the wonderful switching here. Um, and uh, he also, so me and Brian work together for all the live chats. So he'll generally like input all the media and then I'll start to do the switching for my competitors he's talking to. Um, we've got Dan, who's our director of engineering, and he's the one who all of your website complaints end up going to. He's also the one who gets to talk to Discuss every time Discuss goes down. So everybody send all of your prayers to Dan every time Discuss has issues. All of your good vibes to him, because he's always the one like trying to push those outages along, along with Courtney, um, who's also helping with that. And then uh, Zach, who uh, has came on last year and has done so much to make the camera control application um, really a thing that adds value to the viewers' lives and the camera operators' lives. He's also done some really good stuff that allow us to like 
edit more quickly so I can put out stuff to YouTube sort of same day. Charlie, everybody can download stuff like same day onto their phone. He's done some really, really good things on the camera control application. Um, and then we've obviously got Catherine, who I mentioned earlier, and she helps manage all of our camera operators. And then her whole admin team, um, they've been great. They're, it takes a village, really, to manage all of those. And then all of our moderators, too, especially we have a whole group of new YouTube moderators who are fearless, and our website moderators who are like always providing good information. They're like always talking to you, and they're saints, <laughs> especially when stuff goes wrong that they don't know the answer to, or have to go look up or have to go bother myself or me about some stuff. So yeah, um, it really is a lot. Am I missing anybody? I feel like I am. No? Uh, uh, well then, there, yeah, there's Liz who also manages, make sure she's everybody get paid on time. All the contracts are signed, all the business stuff as well. Make sure we have a live cam agreements and bills are being paid. Yeah, so Liz is, I always be on Liz's good side. It's a good rule of thumb, yeah. Yeah, many, many unsung heroes working for the organization. So I'm, I'm glad to be part of the team. You know, I often in the, in, in the face of it online, but there's so many people working behind the scenes to make sure that you can talk to me and, and I can talk to the audience. So I'm very thankful for all of those folks and, and their help and hard work. Uh, one of the improvements that we made this year uh, to the website was just a message partner button. You can find that really right above the comments on explore.org. So that's a great way to get in touch with the partner if you have a specific question for them. Uh, just be, just keep in mind that it's not for technical issues. So if you are curious about that, um, you know, hey, the, the website's down or I'm having trouble loading the feed or whatever it is, don't send that to the partner. You can write to feedback at explore.org with any website issues. But that partner button's a great new feature if you have questions. Um, for like the ranger staff um, at Katmai National Park, for instance. Uh, but Candace, Joe, great conversation. Um, really glad that you were um, able to join me today um, and talk the tech of the bear camps. I certainly learned some more stuff about how difficult of a task it is to get these cameras up and running. Thank you for having us. <laughs> sure thing. My pleasure, Mike. Yeah, thanks again. And. Um, and I want to, you know, uh, announce, I have a big announcement really at the end of our chat today. Um, some of you may have been watching this whole entire time, waiting for me to get to this point. <laughs> um, so I appreciate your patience. And this, uh, I want to announce our snapshot contest winners. Uh, there is a uh, snapshot feature that uh, when you're watching the webcams on explore.org that you can use. Um, and it's a great way to share your experience with other people. So what we asked everyone to do in the audience is favorite um, some of those snapshots and those go to a separate web page, which everyone can view. Uh, but the ex staff from Explore.org went through those favorites um, that were selected by the audience and we picked out some of our favorites. Um, and I'd like to announce the winners. The winners will get a, uh, a custom made mug with an image, a cartoon image of one of the, the Brooks River Bears on it. So. Uh, the first one that we have up that I want to announce comes from Eric28. Uh, and this is an image of Lefty napping upstream of the falls. So uh, with a belly full of salmon, undoubtedly. Uh, the next one is uh, comes from Shell with one L. Uh, this wolf that we've been enjoying over the past uh, uh, two and a half weeks or so fishing at Brooks Falls. Great, crisp, clear image of, of that wolf. And then Ali Gator. Uh, has a, a beautiful sunrise image over the mouth of Brooks Falls. E.V. Wada uh, took this uh, fantastic picture of number 803 and her two surviving cubs. She recently lost a cub, so a sad event for her, but she's persevering to help uh, raise her two additional offspring. Springer Mom brought us this view of a rainbow trout on the underwater camera. So a fantastic look at one of, of Katmai's iconic fish species. LLI brought us this uh, photo of 708 Amelia and her yearlings. Um, so just a, an adorable picture of a bear family there. Carol Bear uh, brought us this close up of a subadult bear enjoying its fish. In, uh, in the lower Brooks River. So a lot of bears fishing successfully near the mouth of the river right now. So tons of bear activity on the lower river. Check out those cams if you haven't yet. Bears 6-1 took this great image of 719 and her yearlings uh, on a road from the lower river camera. She has some pretty tubby looking cubs at this time of the year. And Barbara Horan uh, 
took this uh, great photo of a cub sitting in the grass, just an adorable, small, cute bear there. So thanks to everybody who um, participated in the contest. Keep taking your snapshots. Um, you know, we look through those. It's a great way to share your experience with the audience overall. Explore.org will contact the winners uh, through the email or social media account that's linked to, to um, your profile. So make sure that's up to date. And if you don't hear anything within a week or so, you can always write to feedback at explore.org and inquire about that. Uh, our next live event will be tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern time, 5 p.m. Pacific, when I host a live play-by-play -play, uh, talking about bears and salmon and Brooks River with you. So stay tuned at, uh, at that time at the, on this live chat channel, and I'll be uh, broadcasting talking about the bears and salmon live. We never know what we're going to see. It's always an exciting time and fun time. So I hope uh, that you'll join, join me then. Again, my name is Mike Fitz with Explore.org. Thanks for watching and never stop learning.